Amen. Praise the Lord. Be seated. <laughs> it's good to see you this morning. Live, glad, glad that you are alive and well. I'm getting all my wiring all straightened out here. I went shorter than you were supposed to today. Scare me like that. I have time to drink my water. I know. Crystal was out of town all week. What do you expect? Nothing gets done. But praise the Lord. We're continuing a series of messages. In fact, we've really been focusing on this whole theme the last few months about the end times. Uh, as you look in scripture and you begin to study prophecy, you kind of break it down into segments and uh, like what's happening in the world religiously. And we dealt with the apostasy series uh, last couple of months. And then you move into what's happening in the world kind of culturally. That's where we are right now to begin this series. And we'll start looking at some of the uh, more spe specific items in regard to the end times as we get into next Sunday with some overview materials and presenting uh, a little deeper material, perhaps maybe than what you're even used to in prophetic studies. Um, I say that because a lot of people, when they preach like on the end times, they'll talk about the rapture. So, and they'll talk about the rapture and pull out some scriptures. But we're going to go a little deeper than that. We're going to talk about uh, some really popular ideas about the rapture. It's not to say that there is a rapture. A lot of people believe that, but there's about five different views in regard to the rapture. So we're, we're going to put on our thinking caps next week and get a little deeper into that and look at that. But today we're continuing what we didn't finish up last week in regard to the last of the last days. And this deals with what is happening in culturally. And this is not just in America, this is globally. <laughs> Too often we open our Bible and we read it from just an American perspective and realize that God's dealing with the whole world, amen? But this is what you're going to see in the world. And if you uh, have the capacity to pay attention for a very long time, it doesn't take long to look around and see, this is where we are. This seems to be so accurate of the day and the age that we're living in today that it, it should be almost enough to kind of rattle our cages a little bit and say, wow. Uh, what we talk about, and we started this, week, this study last week about the, the, the characteristics of the last generation from 2 Timothy chapter 3. But you're going to see these things have gone on for a long time since the beginning. But when he's talking about in the last days perilous times, when he says men, he's talking about in as a whole. I mean, this is where the culture is going to be. Not a person here or a group of people here or a nation there, but culturally where the whole world seems to be. And certainly as we look at this today, I hope uh, you'll be able to say... Well, that, that, that is where we really are. Let's look in Scripture as we begin this uh, second part of the last of the last days. In this message from 2 Timothy chapter 3, where the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, giving him some real clarity on what these last days will be, be like. He says, but realize this. In the last days, difficult times or perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful and unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. Now this is really kind of follows, I think, accurately in our study of apostasy, we talked about the religious world and what was happening there, and start looking at what kind of flows out of that, what will people be like? Because certainly, if the apostates embraced the kind of philosophy about life and just, it was all about them, uh, and that was, the, that was the major concern of the apostates, you see how that just flows right into the culture in which we live. So we started last week with talking about uh, the lifestyle characteristics during the, during the difficult times. And again, remember when he says in the last days, it's, it seems general, but he's talking about using a word in, in the Greek language, chronos, which deals even more specifically that there is a designated and a fixed period of time right before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ where men are going to behave in this manner. Where if you want to know that you're in that day before Jesus comes, before his appearing, this is what it's going to look like. It's going to be difficult. We use the word perilous times will come. So I believe that we're in those days. And we started in our study last week by going down this list. There's 17 different, you know, descriptive terms that are used here. And, and I don't think that Paul just, you know, had extra ink in his pen. He just said, let's add some more adjectives. You know, I believe this comes under the inspiration of scripture. 
The Holy Spirit's guiding this pen. He's speaking to him and he's giving a clear, distinct representation of people in the last of the last days, the days I believe that we're looking in. Quick overview. We, we mentioned five of these last week with the self-loving. And by that, remember, we talked about this particular word, meaning, you know, that the whole idea behind most people's life will be this uh, this idea of just focusing my life on me. We're living in that generation. We've never seen a culture like this that's so absorbed with ourselves. It's all about me. It's all about me time and me world and my life. And yeah, I know I'm married to you, but you know, what about me? And I need time for me. And yeah, I know I go to church with you, but hey, you're really here for me. And you know, I'll come and so you can do something or serve me or minister to me. Or, it's just the age and the day that it certainly describes. It's that word phileo autos in the Greek language taken from two words, phileo for that, that, that brotherly love. And, and autos, which, you know, has to do with automatic, really gets down to self. In other words, it's a self-loving generation. The second thing we said about them was that there's this self-indulgence. And he talks about they're not only lovers of their own selves, they're covetous. All right? They're covetous. And the word there is, is similar to the first word, this word auto, but it, it's, it's a different context. of Now it's not just lovers of self, it's lovers of silver. This, I mean, the phileo is not the auto, that they would love material things. They, they'd love possessions. And again, a certain accurate description of this materialistic age that we're living in when we actually think that if I can get more things, then I'll be happy. And if I have more things, you know, then I get more stuff, then, then the happier I can be. The third element we said about that was the self-centered and uses the word here that they are boasters. Now, if you think about it for a moment, that's kind of an obvious thing here because if you're a self-lover, then you're going, to be an, you're going to be an arrogant braggart, all right? You're going to boast in yourself. And the idea, remember we looked at this word a little closer last week, was the idea that, you know, you're boasting, but you really don't have anything to brag about. You know, there's a lot of people that are just like that. They're, 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 they, I'm the greatest, but yet they don't have anything to back up with them being the greatest. The fourth was self-righteous. And the word here in the language of the scriptures was blasphemos, which we get the word blasphemous from. And it has to do not just blasphemy against God, but it's blasphemy against men. That I just speak ill of God, I speak ill of others, it's all about me. And, you know, of course that kind of goes along with this, this arrogance that you have, that you become kind of impious and certainly not centered on God in your life. And he says, the self-loving, self-indulgent, self-centered boasters, which leads to, Again, this kind of is an obvious flow here, you know, from self-righteous to self-ordained. And he uses the word apithes, which means unpersuadable, all right? You can't convince them of anything. They've kind of, they've kind of set themselves up in a place of authority which no one gave them and which they don't, they don't have any right to, but yet they've done it anyway. This is certainly a characteristic uh, feature of the end times culture that we're living in, of humanity today, you know, when everybody, you know, wants to be the king of their own little domain and wants everybody to bow and to recognize or to pay attention to them. It just kind of comes out of that whole mindset where you start up here with self-love. When you start with the idea of self-love, and again, that's that humanistic philosophy of you got to love yourself before you can love anybody else. Again, folks, loving ourselves is not the issue. We love ourselves too much. And if we, if we can't address that issue of self-love and come to the cross and deny ourselves, take up the cross and follow Jesus, we're never going to be what God has called us to be. And we kind of ingrain this in our culture, through our educational systems, even into homes that poured in. There's a, such a thing as having a, a self-respect, you know, and a, and a self-understanding and a self-acceptance. But boy, we've, we've completely gone off the chart with this thing and made it all about self-love. And again, it just leads to more ruin and, and, and more troubles. It even comes into the church, you know. We talked about this arrogance and blasphemous stuff that comes into the church. And it kind of comes in like this when we, we, will, we will quote all the scriptures about being champions and victors and overcomers, but yet we won't follow Christ in our life. You know, we, we chant all the scriptures about, you know, I'm the victorious, you know, I'm a child of God, I'm a child of the King. Hey, praise God, we are. But yet if we're not choosing to embrace disciplines in our life and commitments to Christ and, you know, uh, uh, surrendering our hearts to Jesus, then it's all just hot air, is it not? And I think we end up with the same kind of self-righteousness, self-ordained attitude. Now, we talked about that last week because he uses the word here about disobedience here and disobedient to parents. It's, and, and the basic idea behind that is I don't want anybody telling me what to do. So not only is it in the adult world in which you live in, he said it'll transfer to the next generation. 
They don't want anybody telling them what to do. You don't have a right to tell them what to do. But the Bible says something completely different. The Bible talks about authority and how authority is there to provide protection for us and authority is there to provide direction for us. And if we want to live full, meaningful, safe lives that have value and content, then we need to learn to respond to the authority that God has put over us. If we reject that, it says we're not even rejecting authority. We're really rejecting God because all authority flows down from him. But yet we don't want that. We want to do what we want to do, how I want to do, when I want to do. Nobody else telling me what to do. Amen. Yeah. So we're self-ordained. Now, self-gratifying is kind of where we kind of stepped off the boat there and finished our services up. All right. But this is the word in the scriptures, unthankful. He says here in this verse that they are unthankful. Now, the, the idea is here. I don't need to be thankful because I'm the ends to my own means, all right? I, the world revolves around me, so why should I be thankful? But this is a word which is akaristos. And remember when you have that A in front of these Greek words, it's a negative participle, like a theist to somebody that believes in God. You have an atheist, somebody who doesn't believe in God, all right? So now he has this word akaristos, which means basically without grace. This word charis is the center word, and it's the word for grace. God has given us grace. Grace has been manifest through Jesus Christ. You know, grace and mercy and truth have been granted unto us. And so we receive this grace from God. He said, but in the last times, there'll be people who don't extend grace, all right? They don't give grace. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't love. They don't, they're not concerned with others. They're not concerned with their life, uh, the, the, the lives of other people. They're only concerned with themselves and their, their own lives. With grace, when God presents his grace, he does what? He forgives us. When God gives us his grace, he, he uh, blots out our sins. When God gives us, our, gives us his grace, he, he gives us his power to, 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 to move forward now and to be what he's called us to be. But he said, now you're living in a day and an age when people will not be gracious, all right? When they want to extend grace, they won't forgive like God forgave. They won't blot it out of their memory like God does. They won't look back and say it's all taken care of, it's all settled. They're always looking at keeping an account and keeping a record of the wrongs that have been done to them. They don't forgive. They don't extend forgiveness. And they're certainly not going to help and exert themselves in any way so that you can be better or so that you can go farther or your life can mean more. What marks their life is not graciousness. It's really just the opposite. It's murmuring and cynicism and complaint. But not in the last days that men will be unthankful, gratuitous, not having a heart for Thanksgiving. Don't get caught in that trap. It usually happens when we start letting the world revolve around ourselves and we think that we are where we are by what we've done. And we would not be where we are if it had not been for parents and teachers and others who've loved us, who cared about us, who invested life and time ministry into our lives. Don't get to this place where you become ungracious unconcerned about other people because that certainly leads to this to the seventh thing we have on the list of things where he talks about you know this this idea of a unholy is the word he uses here we're going, we're going to describe it as self-defiled remember here's this word again in the beginning this greek word ah participle anosius and it carries the idea not so much of i'm not religious person all right i'm just you look at him oh he had nothing you never find him in church it, but carries a deeper meaning of gross indecency when it uses this word unholy it's not that they're just not spiritual people. They're indecent. They're immoral. There's a perversion. There's something wrong with them. They don't, get, they, don't, they don't care about things. and They don't care about rights. They don't care about principles. They don't care about standards. They don't care about convictions. In fact, the Greeks use this term, and so do the Jews use this, 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 this mindset of people who refuse to, to deal with a dead body. You know? They didn't care about death. There was nothing to respect a person's life. There was nothing sacred about it, a human life. They just, you just leave them out. It's okay. Just that, and, and, and that would be indecent. The, you know, the, it's also used of people who would commit incest. And certainly that's a characteristic of the day and age that, that we're living in with, without any doubt. But the unholy person that he's describing here would be a person who's simply driven by so much self-love, they're going to indulge their lust or their desires, whatever sort it might be, without any concern for what is acceptable or holy or even sociologically uh, responsible or decent, you know, without any regard for their own reputation. They're just going to do what they want to do. They are unlike anything that God is like. They, they're not like that at all. They're unholy. The eighth term that he uses here is this one. 
self-focused. And it's the word, when you look at it, it's called unloving, is the way it translates in Scripture. It's the Greek word, again, that begins with this negative participle, ah, and it's the word storgos. And the word storgos is a word that has to do with love. Now, we've talked about love from the, from the, from the Greek sense in the, in the scriptures and the words that are used. I mean, you have eros, which is like an erotic type love that people sometimes think that's love, but it's not. And then there's that word phileo that we've used already several times in this study, love of brother. We get the word philanthropist from or Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. You see that word. But the, and there's that, that, that highest form of love. We are really familiar. Most Christians understand the word agape. You know, we talk about the agape, that that. that that sacrificial, uh, highest kind of love that, that, that's, 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 that's known to man. And that's the kind of love that God is, the pure love and concerned about you and committed to you to the point willing to sacrifice himself for your better. And that's the love of God. For God so agape, loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's genuine, deep, real agape love. And then there's another word for love in the Greek language, which is word storgos. It has to do with love for family or even translated a couple of times in, in the Greek literature as a, as a love for country, like patriotism or love for my, 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 my social surroundings, my, a love for my, my neighbor, all right? He said, but in the last days, you're not, you're not gonna see that kind of love. People are going to be unloving because they're self-focused. They're not interested in family. They're not interested in social status. They're not interested in a patriotic love. In fact, the, the King James uses this word and translates it this way, without, without natural affection, all right? They don't, have, they don't have natural affection. It's a negative adjective from that word that was used to talk about a love for my family. You don't see that kind of love in the world today, do you? People don't care about their families. They leave their husbands, they leave their wives. Parents don't care about their children. Children don't care about their parents. They're without natural affection. In other words, God is saying, it's natural for you to have an affection towards your family. I created you to have that in your life. Now, as a sinner without Christ, we don't have a love for God. But once we have Jesus come to life, the Bible says God gives us a love for God. We have the love of God, the Bible says, because the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 5 comes into our life, you know, so also comes the love of God. So we receive this, this new love, not natural to our fallen nature, a new love for God. But there is a love that is natural to your fallen nature, and that should be a love for your family. But now we don't have that in the culture that we're living in. They're without a natural affections. You know, they're without common decency and common affections. They, they only care about themselves and what, what they want. That's why husbands leave wives and wives leave husbands and on and on it goes. And it could even go into the area of where you're talking about the, the movement among the gay community, the, the gay, uh, the lesbians, the homosexuals, the transgender. We don't want the natural, natural family. We don't want a, a man for a husband, you know, you want a woman to be your husband or vice versa as it goes with the culture. Without natural affection. Because what is important is me. What do I want? The key word is always in this whole context of scriptures, self. You know? Now, we're, unfortunately, you're born with self. <laughs> but when we choose to invest our lives in ourselves instead of repenting and seeing what God can do with our lives and changing our hearts and lives, it just begins to, to escalate. Kind of show you how it just works, even in the common, the common place of just children who are born, you know, watch children with their toys in, in playtime. You know? They don't have to be taught to be selfish, do they? It's natural to us. I, I have this little deal called the child's law of adverse possessions. You may have heard this before. There's about 10 things here of the child's law of adverse possessions. It goes like this. If I like it, it's mine. If it's in my hand, it's mine. If I can take it from you, it's mine. If I had it a little while ago, it's mine. And if it's mine, it must never appear to be yours in any way. Number six, if I'm doing or building something, all the pieces are mine. If it looks just like mine, it's mine. If I saw it first, it's mine. If you're playing with something and you put it down, automatically it becomes mine. <laughs> and number 10, if it's broken, it's yours. <laughs> that more reflects today in our culture, the average adult. Does it not? 
This whole idea of just natural affection and love for caring and people and family and friends is gone. And you follow that up, and why is it gone? Because it's not going to be maintained because people, he says, in the last day are unreconcilable, and that has to do with being self-willed. They refuse to change. They refuse to change no matter how desperate their own situation becomes. It's like, I'm right. I don't care if it costs me everything. I don't care what it costs. I want to do what I want to do. Yes, it may damage my life. It may damage my future. I may lose my but I don't care. I want my way. I want what I want, and I want it now. And we end up being this self-willed kind of person who's so driven by our selfish desires and so determined to have our own way regardless that the consequences may be devastating to our own family or our own lives. We don't forgive. We don't want to forgive. We know we need to forgive. We know what God says. But there's no reconciliation now. There's no compromise here. I'm not going to, there's no court of appeals. And again, to reflect a little bit about that, as you stay, take a step back and see how that, you know, that, that, the whole idea of without natural affection, without love for family can certainly lead to this irreconcilable thing that I do not want to make things right. And that's why you see so many marriages falling apart today. In the 1930s, it was, the estimates were about one out of every 6.8. One out of every seven marriages you know, would end up in, in divorce. In the 1960s, it was one in four. In the 1990s and now it's in, in, and beyond, it's one in two and one in one in, in some places. Why do people just not reconcile anymore? Why don't, why don't people want to get help? Why don't people want to get counsel? Why don't people want to make things right? Because they fall into this category of becoming self-focused and, and unreconcilable. And, and the world's about them now. What do I want? I want what I saw on the TV show. I want what I saw in the movies, which is not realistic. People are bent on having their way, even when it means destruction. You can sit down with these people and you can say, but here's, here's what God says. If you want a full and meaningful and a satisfying life, then you should forgive or you should restore. Or you should, you know, but God hates divorce. Don't go that route. That's just more miserable pain in your life. I don't care what God says. I don't care what the church says. I don't care what, I want what I want. Unreconcilable. Y'all getting real quiet. Number 10. Maybe you're hoping the list will go faster. Self-promoting, and this is the word in Scripture says they're malicious gossipers. King James verse says false accusers. In other words, they're so in love with themselves, they have to gossip and put other people down so as to elevate themselves. They become the judge and the jury of everyone and everything around them. It's a maliciousness. It's not just gossip. He says it's malicious gossip. It's a sin that's even more destructive sort because the idea is not just to gossip make me feel better. It's to gossip to make me feel better and to tear them down. That's the difference. It's one thing to gossip just to elevate yourself because by making people look bad, you look better. But the idea, it goes beyond that. It, it goes beyond to damage and destroy someone. I'm going to take care of them. They're going to wish they had never crossed me. They're going to wish they had never met me. That's the mindset. In fact, that this word in, in the Greek language is an interesting word. It, we get the English de derivative of this word. Uh, we would say somebody is diabolical. The, the literal Greek term is diabolos, which we, the, the, you know, it's in, in the Spanish language is the same, diabolos. You know, it's a, we, the word we use mostly to, to, to say who? The devil, all right? This is this word. And it's used to describe Satan, or even Satan is called by this terminology over 34 times in the New Testament. It uses this particular word. Why? Because Satan is always about accusing. Satan is always about speaking harm. Satan is always about using words to offend. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. And boy, when are we ever more like the devil than when we start doing the same thing? Accusing and judging and gossiping and railing against people. You know, if, if, you're, if you think it's spiritual to sit down and think, well, I'm spiritually right with God now, so I can, I can earnestly and, 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 uh, and, and readily discern what's wrong in your life, and I'm willing to tell not only you, but everybody else about it. You're not spiritual at all. In fact, you fall in this category of self-promoting, because that's really all the reason behind it, is just to lift you up, make you look better. Be careful about being negative about people, even in a spiritual way. Well, you know, let me just, let me give you some Bible verses and back up me tearing somebody down. Uh, my favorite one is this. Uh, would you pray for so and so? I'll be glad to. Well, let me tell you, you know, so you can pray more intelligently what's going on. I don't need you to tell me the details to pray intelligently. In fact, you're proving your unintelligence by telling me. Come on. Amen. Yeah. It's, 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 it's just so satanic and so devilish when our mouths get stuck in this gear and it's so easy for any of us to do, is it not? 
to get in a place where we start just criticizing and ridiculing or laughing or tearing somebody down and promote. Many times the simple idea is to promote ourselves. Mama's here today, I'll quote her. If you're not an eyewitness, you're a false witness. Amen. Amen. If you're not an eyewitness, you're a false witness. And there's too many people who say stuff like, well, I have it from a good source. If they told you, that shows you they're not a good source. I'll say that again in case you didn't get it. If they told you, it proves they're not a good source. If they're about gossiping, if they're about, you know, using their mouths to tear down other people, that's not good information. That's not a good source. It's a polluted well. It's not a well that brings forth sweet waters. It's bringing forth bitter waters. We have to always be on guard for this because it's such a deadly sin that so many of us are so susceptible to. And we have to be guarding ourselves lest we do the same thing. Malicious gossips and, and accusers, also a title given to Satan. Y'all heard about the preacher who preached an hour message on gossip? And the worship leader probably been sleeping during most of the service, so he gets up and sings for the invitation. I love to tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people that love to tell the story, aren't they? <laughs> Amen. Self-promoted. The 11th, and again, you see these all just like dominoes lined up, go knocking the next one. Self-concern, and this is the word he says, without self-control. Literally means reckless. King James uses the word incontinent. Y'all know what that means, don't you? It's time for a TV commercial. It's amazing what comes across in TV commercials these days, is it not? No self-control. Now, we use that in the, in the modern day medical realm for meaning something else, obviously, with no self-control. But he's just talking about in life in general, these people are incontinent. Their mouth's incontinent. Their attitudes are incontinent. Their life's incontinent. They don't care about what people think. They don't care about what people say. How many of you have seen these uh, commercials that uh, show in some of the news reports they're doing on these uh, driverless cars that they're trying to develop now? That scares me. <laughs> I don't know about you. I know how often my computer crashes. You think about these car crashes, a little more damage is done. But this is kind of the attitude that the scriptures, when you look at this word, start studying what it means. It's that, that kind of attitude. They're like cars without drivers, just running in haphazardly, making wrecks wherever they go because they don't have any control. They can't seem to control the words, their attitude, their heart. And eventually, when you become this kind of person, you lose control of your own life. And you become a slave to sin, ambitions, and passions. Your life's completely wrecked. They're without self-control. The twelfth term he uses here is this word brutal or fierce, as it says in the scriptures. And I want to use this terminology, they're self-defending. In other words, they're so self-centered. Anything that looks like it might be opposed to them, then they become brutal. And that's certainly, this is a good adjective of our, of our culture. It refers to a savage, savagery like that of a, of a beast whose nature it is to attack their enemies. And not just to attack, but it'll shred them. We have countries in the world like this. We have, you know, uh, we have societies like this. We have churches, I've seen churches that get this way. You know, and they show up at the gravesides of, of, you know, of a fallen soldier to protest. They're just, they're just brutal, you know. They're without self-control. They're fierce. Anybody that would oppose them, you know, you know I don't just get even. I, I, I get full revenge, you know. I exactly, that's this kind of person here. There's, they, they, they're just going to stand their ground. How many of you have watched the news in recent months and years and you see all these, these senseless things that happen? You know, walking into airport with your rifle and shooting people. Walking onto a military base and shooting people. You know, uh, uh, getting on the school grounds and shooting people. Or, or going out and killing your family, you know, and killing your children. And all, all these, and people say, how, how, how can this be? This is what the Bible said it would be like, brutal, fierce days. And then it's not just one thing to get mad and write a letter to somebody saying, I don't like what you, no, we're gonna get our gun and go shoot them and everybody around them. And we don't get them, at least we get everybody they know. That's the fierce culture for, for next time your friends at work start talking about these, you know, these atrocities that are happening in our culture. Say, well, how can people do that? Open your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Say, that just shows we're getting closer to Jesus coming. And if they laugh at you, then open open to 2 Peter. It says, and some will mock. 
<laughs> Some will laugh. Say, well, you too are a prophecy. You're a fulfillment yourself. But this is, this is where all this comes from in our culture. You can blame a lot of different things, but the, all, the bottom line is we are a self-loving culture. Self-defending. The 13th is self-worshipping. Obviously, I mean, you, you, you make yourself the center of the world, then you're going to worship yourself. The word here is, is, is another word in the Greek language. The phileo word is part of this, and also that negative participle. But it's, it's basically a word that, that is used to despise those that are good. All right? Anything that's good and anything that's righteous and anything that's holy, you, you're going to reject that. In other words, you're, you're loving what you should be hating and hating what you should be loving. You ought to be loving good, not despising good. But there are people making lots of money in the, in, in the, in the media industry today who just spend all day despising stuff that's good. Laughing about, ridiculing God, country, patriotism, family. You know, you're outdated, you're ignorant, you know, you're from the backwoods, you don't know any better. No, we just love good. We love God. We love his word. But this culture will say, no, you know, you know basic, I think the idea is people sink to this level of the animal. You know, they're, they're animal-like in their behavior in so many ways. There's a passage in Isaiah which kind of gives you when he's, he's, he's writing, he says, woe to those who call evil good and, and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You know, if something's good, it's bad. Or if it's real good, it's dope. <laughs> we even change the terminology. We try to pick severe terms of that which is not good to describe that which is good, and vice versa. Yeah, but it, it, again, this is the day and the age in which we've come to. As you follow down the line, again, the dominoes continue to fall till you get to this place of treacherous is the word he uses here. We'll, we'll use the terminology self-absorbed. They're so absorbed themselves that anybody, you know, and everybody's fair game. I don't stand for anything but me. I don't, I'm not concerned about anything but me. I, I, I put me over my country, me over my family, me over everybody else, because I am the all-important one in my particular world. And he says it leads to now, and, and why wouldn't it, eventually you turn to this point where you're treacherous against your own family and against your own friends, against people you're supposed to love. Since you're without natural affection, you'll give them up and over. I mean, to follow the logic here, treachery comes naturally to the person who loves himself, to the person who loves money, to the person who's boastful, to the person who's arrogant, to the person who's ungrateful, to the person who's unholy, to the person who's unloving, to the person who's irreconcilable, to the malicious gossip, to the slander, who's lost self-control, who's fierce and brutal and hates what's good. What's next? Treachery, you know? Treachery. You know, just thinking. We, we live in a, in, a, in a patriotic world where any idea of traitorship before would just bring all kinds of resentment to whoever thought that. But Jesus wanted to be like this as well. And he said in the last days that people are going to give up their mother, their brother, their fathers, their sisters, just to protect themselves. And you will be hated because of my name on the account of many. Dr. Nicole's here today, and her being here reminded me of this one. One time, uh, we, we've taken trips to meet with the leadership of the Evangelical Council, and we'd be talking about things to discuss the following year, and one of the questions that was given to us is, uh, how do you think should be dealt, we should deal with pastors who were treacherous during the time of the communist occupation? That they pretended to be loyal servants of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we knew they were working with the KGB. This is, this is the end time stuff. This is, this is what it talks about with treachery. You know, they're, 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 they, you know you're, 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 you're acceptable in their life as long as something there to gain from it. But if I can gain more, if I'm turning you over to somebody, I'll do that. Self-absorbed. Self-saturated. And we move to this realm of treachery. In fact, whenever the church has suffered persecution, true believers have been betrayed in, betrayed in the hands of their opposers, often by members of their own family who value their safety or their prosperity above devotion or fidelity to Christ. Number 15, he uses this word reckless. King James says heady. It's characteristic, is, is, is obviously clear of, a, of the person who becomes negligent now. They're careless, they're rash. Since they're only concerned about their own interest, you don't notice others. You don't care about others. The, the psychological term for this would be a narcissist. 
You know, the world revolves around you. So much so, you're the only thing that's important here. You actually kind of feel that when you go to bed at night, the world goes to sleep too. And everybody else. And they don't come to life till your presence is there. Until you're in the room. Then life begins to happen for everybody else too. It's just the idea, of, of, it, and it leads to this destructiveness. It leads to, to people's lives being ruined and hurt as well as your own. You just don't notice people unless it's related to your own egotistic concerns. And following that, he says, they are also not only heady, King James says they are high-minded, heady and high-minded. So not only are they, you know, I'm numbers 15 or 16 here. <laughs> okay, 16. They're conceited. High-minded means, you know, that they put themselves, they have a higher view of themselves over everybody else and everything is measured by the means of themselves or justified by whatever they think is justifiable. In fact, this word conceit is a unique word. It carries with it in the original language the idea of uh, uh, being enveloped in smoke. For those of you in the military, you know that one thing that you need to do at times to give cover to yourself or to disguise your movements is a smoke screen. We make smoke grenades, all right? And so a smoke screen is laid out so that you can maneuver or manipulate the, the situation to your advantage. This is a word that's often tied to Satan and his methods and his wiles in the scripture that he uses deceit and deception to accomplish his will. And this is what happens when a person starts following their own way. They get enveloped in their own smoke screen. They don't even know what's going on. They're so heady. They're so arrogant. They're being drawn into the trap and they don't even see where they're headed or what life is doing to them because they are choosing to make all the wrong decisions based upon their own interest and their own selfish desires. Remember what Proverbs 12 says in verse 15. It says, the way of the fool is right in his own eyes. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes. It looks good. That's the right choice. But he didn't look through any other eyes. He didn't care about what other eyes see. He didn't look through the eyes of Scripture. The Bible goes on that same verse to say, but a wise man is he who will listen to counsel. Do we listen to counsel? Are we teachable? We're probably living in one of the most unteachable generations the world's ever known. We don't want to be instructed. We don't want to have disciplines in our life. We don't want to have commitments and sacrifices that doesn't fit into our self-agenda. Years ago, a man said, well, psychiatrist tells us that conceit is, is a disease. And here's what's his definition. A strange ailment that makes you think you're fine and makes everybody else sick. <laughs> Another guy said, well, you think you're the fountain of flowing with wisdom, but you're nothing but a little squirt. <laughs> Why do we think we're the fountain? Because we're clouded. We've been deceived. We can't see anymore. We don't think right anymore. Our mind is so out of sorts with reality that we've made our own little reality. And how many people are like that? I'm fine. I'm good. I don't need God. I don't need his word. I don't need the Bible. I don't need the church. I don't need others. You know, I'm, I'm good. I'm doing good. And yet you fail to see the emptiness in your own life. The 17th point and the last point is this about self-pleasing. In other words, it's not God-pleasing. You're not seeking to, to please God at all or anybody else. The final thing here is this lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. There's that word phileo, which means this, 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 there ought to be a love. But what are we loving here? Edanos, the second part of that word, is the word we get for hedonist. A hedonist is just concerned about his own pleasures fulfilling his own desires at the expense of anybody or everybody else. I want what I want because it's what I want. It doesn't matter what happens to you along the way. So you add to these, all these, along with all these other sins, here they are, self-loving, self-pleasing, running headlong in to just satisfying their own desires. It's not limited just to desire for sexual fulfillment in some regard, but it has to do with everything from their food to comfort to any indulgence. They want to indulge themselves. And the idea here is when you look at it, it's not just lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. The idea is there, you know, it's rather than God. They ought to love God, but they don't. They love themselves and they love their pleasures more than they love God. The ultimate description he writes down here in verse five, they hold to a form of, of godliness. Now that ought to make you pause for just a minute because he's describing again a lot of people in the church in the last days. But why will they be this way? Well, he's already talked about so many of the religious leaders in the last days. 
And you can follow through a lot of this list and see how the church has Christianized a lot of these mindsets. It's important for you to be happy. It's important to satisfy yourself. And so out of that comes, well, God wants me happy, right? God wants me happy. Everybody here, God wants me happy. So if you're my wife and you're not making me happy, hasta la vista, baby. God wants me happy. He don't care about you, but he does want me happy. See, I can do what I want. Mom and daddy, you know, I, this, this is just what makes me happy. I can pursue this immoral lifestyle. I can pursue an immoral relationship because I, God just wants me happy. And God becomes our scapegoat, which shows you how blinded and how clouded we are in our thoughts and our life. In fact, when he talks about a form of godliness here, you know, it's like a, it's like a shadow is what this word is. It, it's, 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 it's like a like a, a close representation, but it's not the real thing. It's like if I hold my hand out here on the stage, you know, I see the shadow of my, my arm here, or my body. That's not my arm. There's no depth to it. There's no dimension to it. There's nothing but a form. And there's a lot of people who claim godliness, but all they have is a form. They say the right things. They may do even a few of the right things. They put on the right show. They share the right words, but in themselves, there's no power of God on their life. There's no concern for the, for, for, the, for the kingdom of God in their life. There's no concern for others in their life. There's no concern for people in their life. It's, it's just missing completely. But yet they'll say they're spiritual. But in reality, they're religious, phony, fakes who masquerade as Christians. This is what the scripture teaches. And true believers are giving standing orders here. Avoid these people. Reject their false doctrines, reject their false teaching, reject their false standards that they choose to live by. In fact, the verb avoid here is in the middle voice, and it, the idea is to make yourself turn away. Make yourself turn away. Make a deliberate action. I, 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 I don't need, you know, but he's in the church. He's up saying, hey, hey, if he's not, he's not walking with God, make yourself turn away from him. You can reprove him and even rebuke him and say, but don't you fellowship with him. It's not supposed to be your closest alliances and your closest fellowships. Some of you wonder why you're having such a struggle in your walk with God because you've, you've aligned yourself with perhaps some people that follow this, this, this category. And perhaps it looks cool and acceptable. And all they're doing is ruining themselves and ruining the lives of other people. What are we to do? He tells you very clearly the last part of that verse, such so turn away. So obviously we are turning somewhere. We follow Jesus. Make it your heart's desire to pursue Christ. There's only one way to do that. Jesus said, hey, come on. Any man to come? Come on. Hey, oh, stop You say, Leave self at the door. <laughs> no room for that here. Deny yourself. Notice you being in charge, you having your will, you getting your way, you doing and trying to shape everything to fit your agenda. I want you to follow me. Follow me. And if you'll follow me, we can do something glorious and your life will mean something and you're going to get somewhere and you're going to be something in your life. But if you fail to follow me, you're going to end up with this empty deception, this form of godliness. Deny yourself, take up the cross and follow me. The second thing was pretty simple there about forsake the generation. Avoid such men as thee. These are exciting times. Now, I know we've talked about a lot of negative things here in the context of the characteristics of men of the last days and women of the last days. But I want you to know this... There is in these days a remnant of people who truly love God. There are churches that are truly wanting to, to please God and to seek God's will and to seek God's face. That's what we turn to. That's what we run with, all right? That's who we fellowship with. That's who we associate with. We, we believe the Bible. We believe God. We believe his word, amen? That's where we're going to move and that's where we're going to follow. Somebody ought to praise the Lord. We're living in a day that is described clearly here. Our only hope is to follow Christ and to, to serve Christ and to love Christ. And your life at that point begins to mean something. When you start looking at the Bible, you need to re realize very clearly that Jesus makes it known that he's coming. He made it very clear that he was coming the first time. The Bible in the book of Genesis opens up prophetically when he talks about, you know, how that Satan's going to be judged and man's going to be redeemed because he's fallen and he's turned his back on God. And God comes to the guard and says, Adam, where are you? And he's drawing man. And then he's giving it clear that he's going to, he's going to destroy the serpent. 
So he calls and he said, but at the same time, when you get all these prophecies from the prophets of old that tell us about the first coming, for every one of those verses about the first coming of Jesus, there's eight about his second coming. Now, what's that mean? He's coming. Amen. Write it down. Amen. The first verses, verses eight verses. That's phenomenal to me. I mean, did he come the first time? Did he come like he said he would come? Was he born where he said he'd be born? Did he go live for a while in Egypt like he said he would live in Egypt? Did he live a perfect, sinless life? Was he betrayed by those who said they loved him? Was he hung on a cross like it was prophesied? All, did he come back from the dead? He said, every prophecy came true. Do you not think, do you not think for a moment that God is not going to honor those eight to one verses that says he's coming again? Jesus is coming again. You better get your act together. Amen. Amen. He's coming. And I hope you're ready. So the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking more specifically about some of those things surrounding his coming. But let's start right here, right now, right today. Do we have our hearts right with God? Do we have our hearts right with God? What am I holding back the Lord? Even while I was riding to church this morning and praying about the service and stuff, and man, God just started dealing with me right there, you know, in, in the truck. Uh, it's amazing how the Lord will deal with us when we let him, amen? Right. It's asking me if I was ready for today. Was I ready to preach? Was my heart, had I, was there anything in my life that would hinder him? And I'm going over that in my life and, you know, I didn't have to take a quiz. The Lord just pointed out something right there in my heart. I tried to tell him I've given him so much already. <laughs> like we do. Yeah, it's, I gave up door number one, two, and three for what was in the box. I wanted the box. It's just the box. But then that, that piercing question that the Lord just doesn't let up on, is it all on the table? Can you put it all on the table today? And I think that's the question, you know, where we say when the Lord says deny yourself, we can say, well, Lord, I've denied myself. And then he, the Holy Spirit whispers, well, what about that? Oh, that's nothing. I, I love the story. Maybe you're familiar with F.B. Meyer. He was a great theologian. Uh, I know his grandson did some revivals in his grandson's church who was in the Houston area here. But F.B. Meyer was a great theologian, well-known, great man of God in his time. And there's also another guy who was a young preacher at the time, aspiring. And uh, I remember here at... Uh, David Jeremiah sharing this illustration this week. Maybe you heard his radio program. But he was sharing about C.T. Studd. Charlie Studd was what he was called. He was a big, he was, he was a famous athlete in England at the time. And he'd given up his athletic career to go serve the Lord in China. And F.B. Meyer says, I went to hear Charlie Studd share his testimony. And he said, in the services, God just had wiped me out. He said, I just saw such passion and purity about his life. I said, there's something missing in my life. So he said, I went to ask him, you know. He said, and I asked Charlie, he said, what is it? And he said, just ask me a question. He said, he knew who I was. I'm a famous theologian. He's just a young preacher boy. He said, have you given up everything to Jesus? That's all he said. And usually when that question is asked, most of us already know in our heart and mind, poof, something. We've either held on for some time or something we've just adapted, adopted in our life lately. Give that up. You want a passion for Christ? You want to be ready in these end times? The Bible says if we have this hope in ourselves that Jesus is coming, 1 John says, we'll also purify ourselves as he is pure. So let's stand with our heads bowed. And maybe if the Lord is pointing out something in your heart and your life today as a believer, that's the very thing. That